It all began on October the 7th of this year. On the morning of October the 7th of 2023, Hamas militants launched a land, sea, and air assault on Israel from the Gaza Strip. And this assault caught Israel totally off guard. They were totally surprised by this attack, and it resulted in what is now being considered as the deadliest day for the Jews since the Holocaust. More than 1,200 people, many of which were Israeli citizens, were killed on this day. Many of these people were attending an outdoor music festival, and some of them were just in their homes spending time with their families. There were also over 240 people kidnapped and taken back to the Gaza Strip, and all of this caused Israel to retaliate and seek revenge in a very strong way. Lots of people, both Israelis and Palestinians, have been killed due to this conflict. And I'm pretty sure that most of you already know about these things because it's on the news all the time, right? We hear about it on the news nearly 24-7. In fact, beyond just hearing about it on the news, maybe you've been receiving some questions about these things. That has happened to me. I was in the barbershop a few weeks ago here in Phoenix. And many of the people there know that I'm a preacher. And one of the barbers there, who's a friend of mine, he asked me what I thought about all of this. He asked me what I thought about it from a biblical perspective. He wanted to know, should Christians be supporting Israel? Are they, the Jews, still God's chosen people today? Do they, the Jews, still have a biblical right to the land of Israel? Is this conflict taking place in the Middle East right now a sign that Jesus is about to come back? Should we be preparing for the Lord to do something really amazing in the near future? Those are the kinds of questions I received on that particular day. And maybe you've also been receiving some questions like that. Maybe you've been receiving questions like that from family members, from friends, from neighbors, from classmates, teammates. Maybe you even have questions about these things yourself. If you do, then I want to spend a few minutes trying to equip you with some answers. I want to give you some Bible answers to these Bible questions. While I certainly, and I want to be clear about this, while I certainly do not want to make this lesson have any kind of political agenda, since this is a relevant topic, I think it's important that we talk about it. I don't think we need to run away from it. I think it's important that we spend a few minutes trying to clear up any misunderstandings that folks here may have about this and also spend a few minutes reminding ourselves about what the Bible says about the Israel of the past and the Israel of today. And let's just start by talking about the past. Let's talk about the past for just a little bit. The past, when it comes to Israel, begins with a man named Abraham. It starts with Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 2, God promised a faithful servant of his, a man named Abraham, that he would build from him a great nation. God told Abraham, I will build from you a great nation, and this nation will be given a great land, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, and someone would come through this nation, Jesus, and through him all families of the earth would be blessed. God promised Abraham that a great nation was going to come into existence, and it was going to start with him, and this nation would later be named after one of his grandsons, Jacob, 
Jacob's name was eventually changed to Israel, and these people would be called the people of Israel. And throughout the Old Testament, we're given details concerning their history and their dealings with various nations throughout the world. In fact, some key dates to be mindful of when it comes to the history of Israel includes 722 B.C. In 722 B.C., during a time when there was a divided kingdom in Israel, the Assyrians, the Assyrian Empire, invaded the northern kingdom and destroyed the northern kingdom and took many of those people hostage. They took them into captivity. They also dumped a bunch of people from other nations and to Samaria, and over the course of time, the remaining Israelites, or Jews, as they were being called at that time, who remained in that land, began intermingling and intermarrying with the people from these other nations, and over the course of time, a new nation came into existence, and this new nation became known as the Samaritans. The Samaritans came into existence as a result of these things, and there would always be hostility between the Samaritans and the Jews. We even read about this in the Bible. In John chapter 4 and verse number 9, the reason why it was so radical for Jesus, a Jewish man, to be striking up a conversation with a Samaritan woman at a well is because in John chapter 4 and verse number 9, the Bible says that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom is destroyed, People go into captivity and the Samaritan people eventually come into existence. But then you move on to 605 B.C. And during that year, the Babylonians are the new superpower in the world. And they began to besiege the southern kingdom of Judah. And they take a lot of those folks into captivity. A lot of Jews go off into Babylonian captivity, and that captivity would last for about 70 years until about 536 B.C. when King Cyrus, the king of the Persians, he would issue a law that allowed the Jews to return to their home in Israel. We can read about this in the Bible. We can read about this in the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. And it's important for us to point out that while many of the Jews did return to Israel, Israel and Jerusalem, the vast majority of them did not. They did not return back to their land. They were comfortable with their current lives. They had homes. They had jobs. They had families. They did not want to pick up their families and move back to a land that by this time had pretty much become a wasteland. And so by 536 B.C., Jews are allowed to return back to the land of Israel, but most of them did not. And so Jews are spread out throughout the world. They're spread out throughout the Persian Empire. But now we need to fast forward to a more modern date, the year of 1948. While what happened in 1948 is not found in the Bible, it is significant to this discussion. Following several centuries of different nations and different empires and kingdoms having control of the land of Israel and also due to the Israelites failure to hold on to that land and following World War II and the horrific events of the Holocaust. Many Jews began moving back to the land of Israel, which by this time is, has been called or was being called Palestine. It was called Palestine going back to the time of the Roman Empire. In fact, once the British rule expired, on May the 14th of 1948, Israel was declared an independent state by Jewish leadership, and this was recognized by both the United Nations and the United States of America. And while this did please the Jewish people and a lot of people across the globe, it did not please the Palestinian people who had already been living there for a long period of time up to that point. During a period the Palestinian people call the catastrophe, thousands of them did not appreciate being evicted and forced to move out of their homes due to most of that land being given to the Jews. They did not appreciate 
being allowed to only live in certain sections of that land. And you add to that all of the differences these two nations have when it comes to religion and what should be done with the city of Jerusalem. And it's not hard to understand why these two groups, Jews and Palestinians, have such disdain for each other. They hate each other. They cannot stand each other. In fact, throughout the years, they have had problems and conflicts and acts of terrorism and a lot of wars. In fact, the current conflict going on over there right now between Israel and the Islamic group Hamas that essentially controls the Gaza Strip, that is tied to the continual hatred and hostility that exists between these two nations. Hamas hates the Jews. And they want to exterminate them and they want to get them out of the land of Israel and the Jews hate Hamas and they want to exterminate them and wipe them off the planet. These two people, you got two nations living right next door to each other and they hate each other. They can't stand each other. And again, I want to be clear. I want to be clear. I'm by no means trying to be political. When I tell you these things, I'm not trying to pick sides. I'm not trying to tell you which side to pick. All I'm trying to do is give you a brief bit of information that can hopefully help you understand some of the background and the reasons behind this current conflict. And I know that I left a lot out of that history lesson. Many of you are much more educated than I am when it comes to this. There's a lot more we could say about this, but you want to go to lunch at some point, right? Can't spend a whole lot of time on all of that. But what I really want to do for the remainder of this lesson is attempt to answer any Bible questions that people may have that relate to this. I want to give you some Bible answers to some Bible questions. And when it comes to all this conflict going on right now in the Middle East, a lot of people want to know, they want to know, are the Jews still God's people? Are the Jews the physical descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the Israelite people, the Hebrew people that we can read about in our Old Testament, who were God's people then, are they still God's chosen people? Do they still hold a special place in God's heart? Are they still a holy nation unto the Lord? There are a lot of people who would answer yes to this question. A preacher by the name of John Hagee, who preaches over a mega church in Texas. He is a big proponent of this. He has gone on record on numerous occasions saying that Christians are commanded by God to support Israel because the Jews are still God's people. He says the Jews are still in a covenant relationship with God because of their DNA. He is a big proponent of that, and he's not the only one. In the 1970s, in the late 1970s, President Jimmy Carter became famous by voicing his belief on this. He once famously said, I am for the Jews because God is for the Jews. A lot of preachers believe this. A lot of politicians believe this, and certainly there was a time when that was the case. There was a time when the Jews, the Hebrews, the Israelites were God's special people. So when you get your Bible out, we're about to look at a lot of scripture, so it will serve you well to have a Bible, because we're about to work these Bibles pretty good over the next few minutes. And so in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, as we go to the book of Exodus, the 19th chapter, after God had miraculously so freed the Israelite people from several hundred years of Egyptian bondage, after he miraculously brought them across the Red Sea into Mount Sinai and gave them their own special law, which included the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse number 5, this is what the Bible says in Exodus 19 and verse number five. The Lord says, then if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine. And you should be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. The people of Israel are hearing this message from God. 
And you put that with what you find in the book of Deuteronomy as Moses speaks to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter seven and Deuteronomy chapter seven and in verse number six. In Deuteronomy chapter seven and in verse number six, Moses tells the people, the people of Israel, for you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all of the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You see what both of those passages are telling us? There's so many other verses we could put with that, but I think you get the point. Notice how at this time, during the time of the old covenant, the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, they were God's holy people. They were unique. They were special. They were above all of the other nations on the earth. They had a special relationship with him. They had a special law given to them. They had special promises made to them. They even had a special land that was given to them, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. Under the old covenant, they were gods, special people. But the question is, 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 is it that way today? Today, as I speak to you right now, are the Jews, the physical descendants of Abraham, are they still God's special people? Are they still his holy people? Is merely being born a physical Jew still all that's required to be part of God's family? I emphatically submit to you that it is not. It is not unlike under the old law. Or under the old covenant, under the new covenant that has been instituted by Jesus Christ, anyone from any nation can be a child of God. Anyone can be part of a special and holy nation unto God. Anyone can experience a covenant relationship with God when they obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we find that all throughout the New Testament. You ready to look at a lot of scripture? Let's go to John chapter three, because this is what Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to understand. You remember this famous conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, a Pharisee in John chapter three and in verse number three. Remember, the conversation goes this way. John three, verse number three. Jesus answered and said to him, he's speaking to Nicodemus. Truly, truly, I say to you. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice how Jesus saying is saying here. It's not enough just to be born a Jew. Not when it comes to being part of his kingdom, not when it comes to being part of his church or being under his covenant. It's not enough just to be born a Jew. You got to be born again. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time unto his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's talking about water baptism, being baptized for remission of sins, unless one is born of water and the spirit. That means being converted by the teachings of the Holy Spirit, being converted by the scriptures that have been revealed by the Holy Spirit. Unless one is born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying some radical here to a Jewish leader. There's going to come a time when you can't just depend on being born a Jew to be part of God's family. You're going to have to be born again. You're going to have to be born again of God. You're going to have to be born again of the gospel. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's how it works in, when it comes to being part of his family or his church. And we don't stop there because we move on to the book of Acts. And Peter said, preached this very thing to the household of Cornelius. When Peter went to a Gentile household to preach the gospel in Acts the 10th chapter and in verse 34 and Acts chapter 10 in verse number 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, not just the Jewish nation and every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. You see the difference now. It doesn't matter what nation you were physically born into. Jesus says God welcomes all nations. Peter says Jesus welcomes all nations. All nations are welcome unto God under the new covenant. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Brother Brian read for us from 1 Peter earlier. And I want to show you something in 1 Peter 2 because 
it relates to what we're talking about in first Peter two and in verse number nine and first Peter two and verse number nine. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Who's Peter talking to there? Well, he's using similar language that we found back in Exodus. Only here, he's not talking to people who were just born Jews. He's talking to people who've been born again. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to disciples of Jesus Christ. Christians are the chosen race. They're part of a royal priesthood. They are part of a holy nation unto God. That's what Peter is saying in that text. He's preaching the same thing here that he preached to Cornelius. And we're still not done because let's move on now to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. We get us some Ephesians chapter 2 and we look at verse 11. In Ephesians 2 and verse 11, Paul here is talking to Gentile Christians that's people like us. We're not Jewish. He's talking to people like us. In fact, every time you see the word Gentile in these verses, just put your name there. Put your name right there in that text. And, and, and Paul says this, therefore, Ephesians 2 verse 11, remember that formerly you, that's Sean Jeffries, Sean Jeffries, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, that's the Jewish teachers, which is performed in the flesh by mere hands, remember that you, Sean Jeffries, were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Under the old covenant, people like Sean Jeffries come be part of God's family. We were not part of Israel. We did not have that special covenant relationship with God. But in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you, Sean Jeffries, who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Notice how under the new covenant, people like Sean Jeffries can be brought near to God. I can have a relationship with God. I can be part of God's family because of the blood of Jesus. That's what Paul says. Now, one more place. I want to work some Galatians in. I know those of you in the auditorium class you're looking at Galatians. We had some studies on Galatians in our Zoom study a few weeks ago. And listen to what Paul says, because Paul really talks about this in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, Galatians 3 and verse 25. I'm looking at Galatians 3 and verse 25. And Paul says, but now that faith has come, that's the system of being justified by faith in Jesus. That's here now. And we're no longer under the tutor. That's the schoolmaster, that old law. Don't need it anymore now that we can be justified by faith in Christ. Verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. Verse 28, you see verse 28 that is an amazing verse. That is an amazing verse because everybody mentioned in that verse under the old covenant could not inherit. Under the old covenant, women could not inherit. Under the old covenant, slaves could not inherit. Under the old covenant, Gentiles, people like us, could not inherit. But Paul says we now can inherit. When we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we can become sons and daughters of God. We can clothe ourselves with Christ. We can inherit. We can become children of God. That's what Paul says. That goes to all nations who submit to Jesus. And in one more text, that Galatians 6 text, Galatians chapter 6, verse 15 where Paul closed the book by saying, Galatians 6, verse 15, for neither is circumcision anything or nor uncircumcision, but a new creation, born again, there that is, and those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Wow. Notice how the Bible says that under the new covenant, there is an Israel. There's an Israel as I speak to you right now. 
And, and that Israel is special. It is holy. It is the family of God. And it's not physical Israel. It is spiritual Israel. It's Christians. It's disciples of Jesus Christ. How often do you think about that? How often do you see yourself in that way? In addition to seeing yourself as a Christian and a disciple and a member of the Lord's church, how often do you just pause and say to yourself, you know what? I'm an Israelite. I'm an Israelite. I'm a priest. I'm an heir. I am part of the Israel of God. Paul is saying here that Christians are the Israel of God today. Christians are God's special and holy people today. Christians are the people who have a special covenant relationship with God. And that means that not only can the Jews be part of God's family today, but so can you. And so can me. We all can be part of the Israel of God when we submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so are the Jews still God's people? They can be. They can be in the same way we all can be when we submit to Jesus. When we submit to his gospel. In fact, this brings us to another question people often have. And that's this. Do the Jews, the physical Jews, have a biblical right to the land of Israel? Do they have a biblical right to the land of Israel? Those who advocate that they're still God's chosen people, they, they say yes. Yes, they do. You remember that preacher, John Hagee, I mentioned to you earlier? He's a big proponent of this. He's actually said on record that he believed that God used Hitler providentially to get the Jews back to Israel. He believes this. He believes they're entitled to this land and so do a bunch of other preachers and a whole lot of politicians. And there's no doubt, there is no doubt. That in the Bible, we can read about God promising the Israelite people this land and even giving them this land. Please go in your Bible to the book of Joshua. I want to show you a couple of things in the book of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 21, please. In Joshua chapter 21, look please with me at verse number 43. In Joshua chapter 21 and in verse 43, after the people of Israel have finally conquered all of the land and they've divided it up, under the leadership of God's servant Joshua, in Joshua 21 and verse 43, the Bible says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And no one of their enemies stood before them, so the Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord God had made to the house of Israel failed all came to pass. Do you see the emphasis of the word all in that text? It's found all through the text. The Lord gave them all the land. The Lord gave them all that he swore to their fathers. The Lord made sure that he fulfilled all of his promises to them. The writer here is letting us know that God did everything he said he was going to do for Israel. He fulfilled every promise he made to them under the old covenant. He is clearly under no obligation to do anything for them today in regards to that physical land. That's what the Bible says here. And it's emphasized again further in chapter 23 and Joshua 23 in verse 15 and Joshua 23 in verse number 15. Joshua says to the people, it should come about that just as all the good words which the Lord your God spoke to you have come upon you, so will the Lord bring upon you all the threats until he has destroyed you off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be burned against you and you will perish quickly off of the good land which God has given you. Notice how in those verses we learn something very important about the land promise. We learn that the land promise was conditional. Do you see that? There are conditions when it comes to this promise. God told them that they could remain on this land if they were faithful, if they were obedient, if they did the things he told them to do. But if they transgressed the covenant, he would evict them. 
he would kick them out. They would perish quickly off of this land. That's what God promised them in those verses. And unfortunately, they did not take heed to that. Unfortunately, and we read this throughout the Old Testament, do we not? We read this in the ministry of Jesus. They continually disobeyed God. They continually went after false gods. They continually rejected God's way, and he did exactly what he said he was going to do. Now, what does that mean practically? Well, practically that means that there's nothing special about the land of Israel today. It is not holy land. It is not sacred land. It is not the place where God commands his people to gather to worship and praise his name. The Jews are not biblically entitled to it. It is nothing more than rocks and dirt. That's all it is. People who are part of spiritual Israel, Christians. We're not seeking an eternal homeland in the land of Israel or anywhere else on this planet. Instead, we're seeking a home in heaven, right? We want to go to heaven. We prioritize heavenly citizenship. We prioritize where Jesus sits right now at the right hand of God. That's what we want to get to. And so the physical Jews have no biblical right to the land of Israel. God fulfilled every promise. He made to them. And then what about this question? Is this conflict going on in the Middle East right now between Israel and Hamas? Is that a sign of something? Is that a sign that Jesus is about to come back at any moment? A lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe that this current conflict going on in the Middle East, that's a sign that the Lord is about to come back. Some even suggest that it is a sign that the Lord is going to come back to Jerusalem. And he's going to establish an earthly kingdom and he's going to reign as a king for a thousand years on David's throne. That is part of a bigger doctrine called premillennialism. A lot of people believe in premillennial doctrine and much of that erroneous teaching and thinking comes from an abuse of so many chapters in the Bible, an abuse of Revelation chapter 20, an abuse of Matthew 24, an abuse of Luke chapter 21, a failure to really consider what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4. When you go in your Bible back to 1 Thessalonians 4, we were studying from 1 Thessalonians 4 this morning. And if you remember, I didn't keep going after verse number 12. There was a reason why, because I wanted to save it for now. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, Paul begins to answer some questions that the Thessalonians had about the return of Jesus. Many believe that Jesus had already returned and they had missed it. Or that maybe he's coming back at any moment and we just need to quit our jobs and, you know, just start getting ready for all of that. And so Paul says that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as to the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night while they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. I want you to notice just a few important observations from that text. First, notice how when it comes to the return of Jesus the Christ, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that Jesus is coming back. Okay, there's no question about that. The Lord is going to come back. He's going to return, and he's going to return like a thief in the night. 
He's going to return like labor pains that come upon a woman with child suddenly. Let me ask you a question. Does that sound like there's going to be any signs? Does that sound like the Lord is going to give us a heads up before the return of Jesus? What thief do you know gives people a bunch of warnings before he breaks in into their house? For those of you who've had your homes broken into before, did the thief give you a heads up? Did he send you a text message? Did he send you an email? Did he call you and say, I'm going to be there at about 1130 tonight? You know thieves don't do that. Thieves don't give you signs. They don't give you a heads up. Instead, they come unexpected. They come sudden. They come without warning. That's how the return of Jesus is going to be. It's going to be like a thief in the night. And when he comes back, when the Lord comes back, he's not going to be reigning. He's not coming back to reign in Jerusalem as a king. He's not coming back to set up an earthly kingdom and bring back the good old days for Israel when they were under the leadership of David. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter one and verse 13 that Jesus will not and does not have to do that because he's already a king. He already has a kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's the church. That's the kingdom of God. And Jesus reigns right now as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you put that with what Peter says. Can we add some Peter to this discussion in 2 Peter chapter 3? Because in 2 Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Peter has some things to say about the return of Jesus. And he says in 2 Peter 3 verse number 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, there that is again, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things ought to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people are you to be Christians and holy conduct and godliness? Notice how when Jesus comes back, there's not going to be any earthly kingdom established. He's not going to set up a literal throne of David. He's not going to reign for a thousand years on David's throne. Instead, Peter says when the Lord comes back, the world is going to be destroyed. It's going to be obliterated. It all, including the land of Israel, is going to be blown up with fire. You know what that means? That means we need to be ready for the return of Jesus at any time. Regardless of what happens in the Middle East, regardless of what happens between Israel and Hamas, we need to be prepared for any moment for the return of Jesus and the entire world being destroyed and the day of judgment. The Bible does not teach that what's going on over there in the Middle East right now is a sign that the Lord is about to come back or that he's going to come back to Jerusalem and reign as a king. That is foreign, foreign to what the scriptures actually say. In fact, this brings us to the last thing I want to talk about very quickly. And that's this question. How should we respond? I just gave you a bunch of scriptures, a bunch of information, but so what? So what? I mean, we don't live in Israel. We live in America. We don't live in the Gaza Strip. We're not Jews. We're not Palestinians. We're not lawmakers. We're not politicians. What should we do in response to something going on on, on the other side of the world? Maybe that's the question you have right now. If so, I'm going to give you some quick practical stuff. What should we do in response to all of this? Well, how about we do this? How about we do some praying? We need to pray. We need to pray for the people over there. We need to pray for the innocent people on both sides who just want to live normal lives, but they are stuck right in the middle of a conflict out of their control. We need to pray for the hurting people over there. We need to pray for the grieving. We need to pray for the leaders of these people that they will come to a peaceful resolution. As Christians, we need to be praying about this. And we also need to make sure we don't lose focus. We also need to make sure that we don't get so absorbed and watching the news and keeping our eyes on the physical land of Israel that we take our eyes off of the spiritual land. We need to make sure that we don't lose focus on where we're going, where we're trying to go. And that's spiritual Canaan. We need to pray. 
We need to make sure we don't lose focus. And we also need to promote and practice love to all people. We need to promote and practice love for all people. We need to make sure we promote and practice love for all white people. And for all black people. And for all Latino people and Asian people and all Israeli people and Palestinian people. We need to make sure that we practice and promote love for all people during this time because God loves all people. Jesus died for all people. Jesus wants all people to be saved as Christians during a time when hatred for Jews and Palestinian people is on the rise. We need to make sure that we promote and practice love for all people. We need to show the world a better way. We need to make sure that we show dignity and respect and a spirit of Christ towards all people. That's what we need to do. In fact, one way we can do that is by taking advantage of opportunities we have right now to share the gospel. You know, it may be that during this time with all this conflict going on in the Middle East, like I had happened to me a few weeks ago, you may have a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a classmate, a barber, try to spark up a conversation with you about this stuff. They may ask you about Israel and the land of Israel and what you think the Bible says about how God feels about this. If that happens, take advantage of the opportunity. Take advantage of the opportunity to talk about the gospel. Take advantage of the opportunity to tell these people that God's family and God's people under the new covenant are Christians. They're disciples and they can be part of that family if they submit to the gospel. Let them know about Romans 1 and verse 16, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Tell them about Galatians 3 and verse 28, where the Bible says that people from all nations can be children of God and be heirs to great promises from God. Tell them about Ephesians 2 and verse 13, where the Bible says that all people from all nations can be brought near to God by the blood of Christ. My dear friends, we cannot impact. We can't impact what's going on on the other side of the world, but we can impact our world. We can impact the people we know in our little world. We can take advantage of opportunities we have in our community to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, while we can't be sure of what's going to happen between Israel and Hamas. I don't have a clue what's going to happen with that. We can't be sure of what's going to happen. We can't be sure of what's going to happen in the Gaza Strip. We can't even be sure of what's going to happen to us in the next five minutes, right? There's a lot of things we can't be sure about in this life. But one thing we can be sure about is we can be sure that if we obey the gospel, God will keep his promise. He will do exactly what he said he is going to do. And so maybe you're here this morning and you need to obey the gospel. You can't control what's going on over there in the Middle East right now, but you can't control how you respond to the gospel. You can control whether or not you accept God's invitation to be part of his Israel today, which is the church, Christians, disciples. And so if you need to become part of the Israel of today, the spiritual Israel, you can do that if you're willing to believe in Jesus and repent of your sins and be baptized into Christ, as Paul said in Galatians 3.27. The Lord will add you to his kingdom, add you to his church, wash away your sins, and you will be part of the Israel of today. And if we can help you with that, come to the front right now as we stand and we sing it.